Okie dokie. I'm Dr. Hughes, and this is intro programming, right? Right? Perfect. You can laugh, but it happened to me once before where I was in the wrong spot. They switched the lecture hall on me once. Uh, raise your hand if you're actually a first year student. Really high, I want to see. Okay, most of you. Cool. All right, cool. The, so this is intro programming. Raise your hand if you have any experience programming. Okay, that's terrible. Most people with experience programming coming into like learning programming have never really been taught effectively and they tend to have a false sense of their understanding. So there's a weird phenomenon where those that come in with some experience do very poorly. So just if you have experience, don't think you're set. Not to say that you're not, but be cautious. This course assumes you know nothing, but it moves fast. So every year people say like, oh, he expects you to know so much. No, I assume you start with nothing, but we do move quickly because there is an insane amount of stuff you got to learn. The, you know, like, like if you've never taken, like, you know, if you're from high school recently, you know, maybe you never took a biology course before, but if you take biology, you know, ha having taken chemistry and some other courses, there's a lot of transferable skills, right? With programming, not a lot of people have any skills that are that easily transferable. So it could be a, you know, a little tricky. And because we assume you start nowhere, and because this is the first course you would take if you're getting a computer science degree as well, we do need to know a lot before we can really get started on anything. So raise your hand if, you th if you're planning on being a computer science major. Okay. And raise your hand if you're not. Okay, well, you've made a poor decision because you should be a computer science major. Maybe by the end of the semester you'll see how fun it is. Of course, I'm teasing. Uh, okay, so there is a Moodle course page, but Moodle is only going to be used for like submitting assignments. All right? Everything, all of the course content is on this website. And the best way to get to this website is just csci161.com. It's the course code. You hit that, it'll just redirect to here. Assuming you have working internet, this will work. So that's how you get there. It does a redirect, but it's just the course code, csci161. And then you're there at the course content. Um, trying to think, what else should I hit before we really get going? Uh, well, let's just get going, and I may or may not quickly go over the outline. So I'm going to go over some of the stuff that's in the course outline. It is 100% your job to read through it and understand it. I'm only going to blitz over a couple of things, but everything you need to know is in the syllabus, the outline. Uh, so let's have a quick look here. Prerequisites, there's no prerequisites. Lecture time, well, you found the first one, so that's good. There's labs, Thursday, Friday. It's important that you go to your scheduled lab, but if there's a problem one day, you can ask me, and maybe we can figure something out. Labs start tomorrow, not next week, tomorrow, all right? Every year, people are like, well, my math prof said labs don't start till, yeah, that's for your math class. This is for this class, labs start tomorrow. Assuming you have a Thursday lab, if you have a Friday lab, well, labs start Friday. Uh, office hours, that's where I am. If you don't know where the annex is, it's that small building on a hill right next to where, it's right over there. I'm in the basement, it's easy to find me. The website, this website, like I said, Moodle will only be used for submitting assignments, textbook and lecture notes. Um, lecture notes are effectively this website. Uh, assignments are submitted through Moodle. Uh, there is a textbook, but it's this free online thing that's full of exercises and stuff, like way more detail than I'll ever get into. Highly recommend working through that textbook. People that work through that textbook, that's, they're usually the ones that get like 99 in the class. So it's really good. A lot of people don't make use of it. Things we're going to cover, we start from the basics. We start from the first program you're ever going to write, 
and we learn quite a bit. We learn about like variables, statements, types, functions, testing, conditionals, Boolean types, iteration, comma, a lot. There's a lot that we're going to cover. This course uses the programming language Python, but this course is not about Python. This course is to teach you the core underlying ideas of a style of programming, which Python is. So we're using Python to teach you these ideas, not the other way around. So everything that we're going to learn, and in fact, if there's people in here that are very familiar with Python and you know a very like Python-y way to solve a problem, I am a lot of times going to go out of my way to not do it the Python-y way and do it the more general way where you could take that code and basically plug it into another similar programming language and it'll work nearly the way it is. I know a lot of people, if you're not used to programming, you may have heard like, oh, there's so many different programming languages. What's the difference between C and Java and Python? Not that much difference, to be honest. If you know one, you kind of know a whole suite of them, really. It would just take a little bit of some syntax changes, but the same ideas are the same. This is an idea that will be emphasized throughout the course. So if you thought you were going to take this course to learn Python, well, you will implicitly learn about Python because we're using Python, but really it's about the underlying core concepts that we're going to be hitting. Can you hear me well at the back too? Perfect. If you can't, just come closer. Here is the mark breakdown. There's four assignments worth 5% each. The point of the assignments is to you know, you know, in, in the course, like, there's the labs, and it's got activities. There's the textbook, it's got activities. There's something called CADIS that we'll learn about that has a whole bunch of like, practice exercises. But the assignments are definitely bigger in terms of what you're being asked to do. And that's a place where you get a chance to really just apply what you've known and learn more by doing. And then you get feedback. And then there's three tests, two midterms, let's call them, and then a final. Now, you might look at that mark breakdown and be a little spooked by it, but what I've noticed over the past few years when I switched this is, so usually in a lot of very technical fields like this in early courses, like a first year course, you get a very like, what they'll call like a bimodal distribution of grades. You've got students that do well, and then you've got very few people, and then you have students that do poorly. What's happened over the past few years, and it, it, co it coincides with this, I don't know if it's causal, but what I've noticed is those modes have been moving further and further apart. Meaning, though, like, those that are doing well are doing better than ever. But those that are doing poorly, well, they're doing worse than ever. So if you're on top of it, and that spooks you, if you're on top of it, this is actually one of the I think it really benefits you. This only really hurts the students that are underperforming and haven't practiced enough and don't understand. Because the point of the test is to measure your understanding. There's two tests during the semester and a final. If you think, oh no, two tests, it's better to have two than one, right? Because if you mess up one, maybe you can kind of recover. And the purpose of having them more is if we have a test earlier in the semester, it gives you an idea of what you do and don't know earlier. It's better to know that earlier than it is to know it later, because when you know it earlier, you can maybe try to make some changes and address that. Oh, uh, the assignments, yeah, you submit them. Due dates, has anyone in here had me before? Probably not. So, due dates. I have a due date that's always, it's usually, I mean, double check everyone could be different. But it's usually due Monday at 11.55 p.m., okay? If you submit it at 11.56, it's not marked. That's it. It's done. You get zero. Lates are not accepted at all. And there are several reasons for this because, like, for example, two reasons is, let's say, let's say you were nearly done the assignment and maybe, like, if you had, like, 10 more minutes, you could definitely finish it, but you know it's due at 11.55, so I'm going to submit it so it's not late. I don't want to take that penalty. I don't want the zero. So I'll submit it anyways, even though I know it's not quite right, and I could have done it, but whatever. 
But then there's someone else who's like, ah, screw it, I'll just submit it late and it'll get marked anyways. Well, who got penalized? The person following the instructions. Never penalize those not following the instructions. No, never penalize those following the instructions. And then there's the other side of it, too, of, okay, if I say it's due at 11.55 and someone submits it at, like, 10 minutes late, and another person submits it 20 minutes late, whose do I accept? Where, where do I draw that line? Maybe someone submitted it an hour late, and then two hours. Who, where do I draw that line, right? It's kind of hard to draw that line. So let's just stick with the line I drew in the first place, 11.55. Great. Uh, what else? Marking will be done by a TA. If there's an issue with your marking, you can reach out to the TA or me and we'll try to figure it out. Usually you just reach out to the TA if there's like a clerical error, they could fix it like that. Uh, tests. Uh, yeah, you can't cheat on tests. You can't bring any electronic devices. If you miss a test, there will be no makeup test, but the weight of your test will be shifted to the subsequent test. So it's, the tests are worth 20% of your final grade, 20% of your final grade, 40% of your final grade. You miss the first test, your second test becomes 40% of your final grade. If you do the first test, miss the second test, your exam becomes 60% of your final grade. If you miss both tests, your exam is worth 80% of your final grade, which is insane. I do not recommend going, like, doing that. Labs, uh, they begin the first week of class. Labs can just basically follow this procedure. Every lab has these pre-lab exercises that you should do beforehand to make sure you're kind of set for the lab. Then you show up, and then I've got these things called like the before caddis exercises. For those of you, like, we'll see it lab tomorrow and Friday. There's the before uh, caddis exercises. This is where, like, these are the core questions of the lab I want you to cover. And then there's the CADIS problems. CADIS is this like online programming competition practice website full of a bunch of like problems for people to solve. And the only way to get good at programming and problem solving, because here's the thing, when you're learning to program, really you're learning how to problem solve with like programming. So they go hand in hand. So all of like that website's a great bank for just practice, because the only way to get good at this stuff is practice. When people come ask me halfway through the semester, oh, I'm not doing that well, I really want to do better, how do I do better? Practice. Yeah, but I really feel like some other, it's really just practice. I know, but the other students seem, no, no, just practice more. That's really all you got to do. I know it sounds too good to be true, but it's the truth. Just practice. Uh, email contact, you can email me. You can ask questions over email, but usually in programming, like, if you send me code in an email, I'm not going to try to answer it. Like, that's not a good place for answering that question. Email will not work well for that. Email is good for quick and easy questions. Hey, this question on the assignment asks this. Is this what you meant? Like, that type of stuff is good. If you have a question about your code, I definitely do want you to come ask me if you can't figure it out. But that would be where you come to office hours. So we could sit down, talk about it, and go through it. Because otherwise, it's, like, it's not possible to work through code and email. It's, it doesn't work well. Office hours, yeah, come to office hours. Attendance is mandatory. Copyright policy. Unless stated otherwise, I own everything here. It's my content, okay? And we have a recording policy. You cannot record me in any way. But don't worry, I do it myself. And I post every lecture that I get the recording for. Sometimes there's a technical difficulty. I post every lecture on YouTube. And I have a YouTube channel, it's linked on the main page. So if you miss a lecture or you want to revisit something, it's all there. You can go through it, it's great. So, yeah. Can I watch from last year? You can watch last year's, you can watch the years before. You, there was actually two sections last year, so you could watch whichever version you want. If you like one room more than the other room, go for it. These go back a few years, so you have access to all of that. Uh, don't cheat, we'll check for cheating. Tutoring, you can get a tutor, but remember, a tutor's to help you learn, not for you to do your stuff. Accommodations, the, this is the boilerplate stuff. It's, it's funny, every year they always talk about these, this, the outlines are getting too big. We want them to be smaller for the students because no one's reading all that. And then every year they give us more and more stuff to throw in the outline, so whatever. It is your job to go through it. And then I get to say the famous thing of where students come ask questions and I say it's in the syllabus. It's a, that's a professor joke. 
It's really funny, I swear. Any questions about this quick blitz thing right here? All right, cool. Obviously, that was very quick. It didn't go in full details, but here we go. So, introduction. So what am I going to learn? Well, in this course, you're going to learn a lot. We're going to learn how to write computer programs. But, you know, sometimes we like to think a little bit more abstractly, like take a step back from that statement and be like, well, we get to learn how to describe formally a series of steps on how to solve a problem, which is stuff that you've done a lot in your life. Like you've followed instructions. Does anyone here ever follow a recipe before? Of course you have, right? You ever follow directions on like Google Maps? Of course you have. Those are programs. Those are algorithms. And I know it might seem like, oh, they're technically, well, no, they are like definitively, they absolutely are. And if you can follow those steps, or if you can describe to somebody how to make spaghetti, you can describe the steps in how to solve a problem. Now, we'll get into this in a lot more detail, and there are definitely like layers of abstraction that we can talk about, like at what level do I describe? Do I tell you like move left foot, move right foot to get to like the pantry for spaghetti, or do I just say boil water and throw in the spaghetti? So there's layers of abstraction, and we'll talk all about this as we get going. But at the end of the day, you've all done this. At the end of the day, all of you have these insane, and I, a lot of people talk about this as like a cliche, but it is definitively true that all, every single one of you is a computing system. It is. I'm not being silly with my definitions. You are. So you know how all this stuff works. You just probably haven't thought about some of the things that you've been doing in the same way that we're about to. But you all have a lot of experience doing this, whether you like it or not. Uh, I mean, like, I'll skip over that, but obviously you've all encountered computer programs before. Here's one, it's a browser, right? Like, obviously you have. They're everywhere now, they're ubiquitous. Traffic lights are run by computers. Like, your phones, you have insane computers in your pocket with your phones. Like, everything, there's a program for everything now. And it's not going anywhere, right? It just keeps getting in our lives more and more and more as time goes on. So prerequisites for the course, there are none. Curiosity, whatever you want to learn. Um, why is the course a website like this as opposed to like slides or something? One, I don't really like slides. I think they're boring. They don't, they don't really work for my lecture style. This, this, I think, works really well for my lecture style. This also gives you like the course notes, like there's a website with all the course notes right there. There you go, it's just this nice flow. And it's broken up, it's curated. Sometimes there's activities you'll see where we work through something. Uh, but why? Well, we're gonna be learning to write program in Python. And here's the funny thing. This website was generated with a tool called Sphinx. Uh, this is what it looks like typically, but I'm zoomed in. It's generated with Sphinx. And all of like Python documentation, like if you're using the Python programming language and like when you're learning like, oh, what function is good for this or how does these set of functions work? It's stuff that we'll all learn about as we go. All of the documentation for Python stuff is generated with the Sphinx. So this is just, I mean, it might have a slightly different template, but it's the same thing. So you're gonna have to get used to looking at websites like this that are describing code. Uh, so yeah, you'll get used to it. And here's an example. Here's like the math library. So you'll see it's a different template, but it was generated with the same thing, assuming it'll work. And you'll kind of see like it's the same. So anyways. How will the class work? Well, it's probably gonna be a little different than your typical lecture, because I do have like activities now, if you have a computer with you that you can bring to work through some of the activities, great. If you don't, it doesn't matter. You can do everything by hand. You don't need the computer. Um, if you sit next to someone with the computer and you work together, fantastic. Like, that's good. Uh, so usually what I'll do is I'll lecture a little bit, and then like, I like more interactive stuff where there's more discussion, talking, asking questions. 
The worst thing is when I ask questions and I just get crickets, like, don't do that, please don't do that. Um, I'll give you activities to work through things, like if, we, if there's like a core concept that we, got, we just learned, I might have a quick activity for you to just apply it, just so it kind of sticks in real good. Uh, at the end of each topic, although I've been updating this, at the end of each topic, there'll be a list of like suggested readings from the textbook where they'll also have a series of questions. If you go through, students don't go through it, but if you do, like those that do, just demolish the course because it's just more practice and it just reinforces what you already learned. These course notes are made for a lecture environment. The textbook, which is made with Sphinx too, so it's going to look similar to this. It's just so much more detail, because it's written and it's designed for like sitting down and reading, not me talking at you. These are more points for me to just bring things up to you as we go. Uh, yeah. And you know, for the fun of it, let's just do a activity that has nothing to do with programming and just get a chance to talk to the people around you. A lot of you are first years, like you were saying, so maybe you haven't had a chance to meet a lot of people. Just take a moment to talk to each other because in this course, I am going to want you to be, like when doing the activities or in the labs, I want you working together and talking to people. That's a really good thing. So take a moment, just chat amongst yourselves. Here's some suggested icebreaker questions if you need help. Go for it. It's, it's already too quiet. Be loud. Talk. <clears throat> all right, all right. Just 
for the sake of time, I, it was about four minutes to chat, which was good. So I already asked this, but raise your hand if you're planning on being a computer science major. Really high, I want to see. That's a good number. That's awesome. Okay, raise your hand if the CS students don't, don't participate for the next. You're, you counted the science one. So raise your hand if, okay, although not computer science, raise your hand if you're in, like, just the faculty of science. Okay. Well, you were CS. Don't put your hand up. You're fine. You're fine. Okay. So, like, who's math? Math. Cool. All right. Math is probably, no, not probably. Math is absolutely the closest to this. In fact, here's a secret. Usually I don't tell the class this until the end of the semester because I don't want to scare them. So raise your hand if you're like, you know what, I don't like math. And be honest. Yeah, so I got some bad news. All of this, this, it's just math. Now, we trick you into thinking it's not, but it is. Usually I don't say this until the end of the semester, so I hope I didn't spook you. But this really is just math. It's a big group of math that it's its own thing. It's computer science, but it is just math at the end of the day. Now, it's not calculus. It's far different than calculus, right? Because I know a lot of you with math backgrounds, like even from high school, you think math, you think calculus, right? Well, calculus is just one type of math. There's algebra, geometry, trig, combinatorics. There's a lot. Computer science, programming, this type of stuff is just one of those things within math. So, like biology, anyone doing biology? No? No one? One? Uh, geology, earth science, anybody? Really? Chemistry? Physics? Physics, cool. Anyone, anyone else in science I missed? Klein, Klein, environment, yeah, yeah, cool. All right, nice. How about faculty of arts? Who's faculty of arts? Two? So what, what's your major? Yeah. Okay, how about you? Poli sci, okay. Anyone else arts? Just trying to get a sense of the set of majors here. Uh, education, anyone doing education? No. Oh. Uh, business? Business, yeah, we usually get a bunch of business. Okay, that's good. All right. Did I miss anybody? Did I leave anybody out? Apparently not. Okay. Well, there you go. Cool. So it's always neat to see people that are, you know, they're not going to take computer science as like a major, but they just want to learn these skills, which I always think is great. Uh, so what should you bring to class? Curiosity, right? Be ready to learn and do stuff. If you have a laptop, like I said, bring it because then you can work through the activities, but you by no means need one to be successful. So now the question everyone wants to know, is this class easy? Well, it's kind of hard to explain. Because the quick answer is no. <laughs> no, it's not. But there's obviously more nuance to it, like everything. So is it easy? Well, a, lot, a very common thing I hear students say that are struggling is they say, well, I understand each individual concept. It's just how we put them together is where I struggle. And it would be like saying, like, who here knows how to use a hammer? Of course you do. A screwdriver? Of course you do, right? Who here knows how to build a, a house? Well. Okay, I know how to do those. Do I really need to? As soon as you need to start using these individual tools that them, themselves are easy to understand, as soon as you kind of have to have at it and use these tools to do something, that's where things get tricky. So this class is by no means, it's, it's not hard, it's not. But it definitely is a class that you need to be on top of for several reasons. For better or worse, computer science tends to have intro programming, like this class, not just here, I mean everywhere. This class tends to be, and when I say everywhere, I mean like every university, it has like an insanely high fail rate, right? But not because it's hard. It really comes down to 
How much did you put into it? There are some courses where you can kind of flake by, get to the exam, get something on paper, get enough marks, whatever. With this type of stuff, it doesn't work like that. When I see bullshit on the exam paper, it's a zero, right? I don't go like, well, how did they? No, no, like that's, it doesn't really work very well like that. So like I just taught a summer version of this course and the fail rate was, who wants to guess? What percentage of the people failed? Close. No, it's 70% of the people failed, okay? Now that was an asynchronous version, so you already have an advantage, as in like there's lectures, right? But yeah, that was kind of to be expected. It, there tends to be a really high fail rate. That, what, the reason I'm telling you this right now is not to scare you. I'm not trying to spook you. I'm trying to have you set the right expectations for yourself in terms of what your expectations are, okay? So everything we're gonna learn in and of themselves are probably, you might find simple, but putting them together is where it gets complicated and complex. The best way to be successful is to be on top of it. Read, use the resources made available to you. There's lecture recordings, I give you activities, I give you suggested readings, I give you the lab material, I give you CATA stuff, I give you office hours, I give you, there's a lot available to you. But you gotta use it. I can't make you use anything. Because, and this is a cliche, but it's so true. Everyone in here, I'm gonna ask you a question, and you gotta answer this question by pointing. Everybody in here, point to your teacher. Try again. Try again, it's not me. I'm your professor, big difference. Point to yourself. It's not my job, and I, if you, if you are listening to this and thinking this sounds negative, that is not the point of what I'm saying. Raise your hand if you're a first year. Really high, okay, perfect. I'm doing, I'm doing you a big favor right now because your other profs probably haven't told you this yet. I'm your prof. The best I can do is facilitate your learning. That's it. I can't make you learn anything. I can't. The only person that can make you learn something is yourself. I give you all the content, I give you all the resources, I lecture at you, there's the recordings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but it's all on you. It's not my job to teach you anything. And I'm not saying that as a dismissive thing, I'm saying it literally is not. That is not what this is. I am not a teacher, I am a professor, difference. I can facilitate your learning by giving you everything you need, but you gotta do it. Like in high school, like if you're failing, the, your parents, your principal, whatever, goes to that teacher and goes like, hey, what's going on, you know, whatever. And it turns into like the teacher's problem to make sure. Like if students are failing, people are breathing down the teacher's neck. For me, if people are failing, no one says anything to me. I'm not looking to fail anybody. I'm just making sure you have an understanding of what your expectations are and how you can set them up for yourself accordingly. It's not my job to teach you anything. It's your job to teach yourself this stuff. All I can do is give you everything I can and then you gotta do the rest. So should I be terrified? No, <laughs> okay? I would say this course is easy if you do what I tell you to do. Like I really think this course, like tests, my tests I think are so easy. If you, know what to, if you know what you're doing, it should be easy for you to get like 100% on the tests. If you don't know what you're doing, I want you to get as close to zero on the tests as possible. My tests are pretty good at that, I think. So like I've designed this course to make it as easy as possible for you. You just got to do it. That's the practice. That's the use CADIS, the lectures, whatever. Practice, practice, practice. You got to put in the work. And like, like a lot of technical fields, so in computer science, there's a lot we got to learn, right? Because like, like raise your hand if you're thinking you're going to take 162. Okay, so just as a thing, a lot of people really like 161. I think 162 is way more interesting because the types of problems that we're solving are more interesting. 
But 162 requires a hell of a lot of knowledge. And 161's job is to get you to learn all that. So there is a lot we're going to learn. I think it's done in a nice way where you can pick it up as we go. But there's a lot we got to learn. So it's very accumulative. And with these technical fields like this, if you don't know what we did yesterday, you're sure as hell not going to know what we're doing today. So if, if you start to fall behind, you have to take care of it immediately. It's not like a course where, oh, the first unit on Egypt, I kind of effed off on, but whatever, I'll pick it up on the next thing when we're talking about Greece. I don't know, I'm pulling this out of nowhere, right? Yeah, that doesn't work here. You, you need to know everything about Egypt before you can learn anything about Greece in this example. So it's very accumulative. If you start to fall behind, take care of it immediately. Because otherwise, that is like a road to disaster. Uh, and here's a really good thing about programming. A lot of people don't realize how amazing this is, but this is huge. So you've all taken a math class before. And you know, you've, uh, you've worked through, you've got an assignment, you're working through the questions, you put your answer down. And then if I ask you, if, if I'm standing next to you as you write your answer down, I go like, is it right? Then what do you say? You go like, well, I hope so. Right? With us, we are so lucky. Because I tell you, write a program to solve x, y, z. And then you write it all out. And if I ask you, well, is it right? You can go, let's check, run. You can know if you're right or not before you submit anything. You, this is such an insane, people don't realize how big of a deal this is. You can know that you're effectively going to get perfect on your assignment before you submit it. Because you know if it's doing what I told you to do. It's brilliant. But here's another thing though. Because you get that constant feedback of like run, ah, it didn't work. Oh, I, okay, let's try to change this, run, well, you know. So, okay, you've seen movies. Let's see if I can find the website. Give me a moment here if I can see if it'll work. Yeah, you've seen, you've seen these movies, right? Where like, oh, you know, uh, the, the, the nuclear submarine's coming, and oh, I gotta, okay, uh, oh, we gotta fight those uh, bad guys with code, right? This right here, what you're seeing here, which, which you see basically in every single movie depicting any programmer, like literally, this doesn't happen. This is not how you write code. There's some statistic, I can't remember it. It's like this, the average software engineer writes like five lines of code a day. This is hilariously like, it's, it's a joke. It's, it's hilarious, it's nothing. That's not how coding works. But I bring that up because a lot of like, Believe it or not, a lot of people show up and expect that they're going to be able to do that. No one does that. The best programmers in the world don't ever do that. Coding goes like this. Okay, let's write like two lines of code, hit run, did it, oh, it didn't work. Oh, let's try to change it, hit run, oh, that didn't work. And then repeat that like 25 times, and then maybe it works. Programming is a bit of a misnomer. Because there's another name we use to describe something called debugging. You write some code, but it's not working quite the way you expect. So you debug. You get rid of the bugs out of your code. Programming really should just be called debugging. Because you will, like, without having more experience of seeing what coding is like, this might not make a lot of sense, but you're going to be wrong. Your code is going to be wrong a lot. Expect to be wrong like 200 times before you're right. And I'm not being silly. When you're working on the assignment, if you write it, you hit run, it didn't work, and you come to me saying, oh, I can't get it working. And I say, well, how many times did you try? You say once. I'm probably going to laugh at you, being like, well, what did you expect? <laughs> you haven't even started. You're going to be wrong a lot. And I, I cannot impress upon you that, like, how much I mean what I'm saying right now. You are going to be wrong every single time you hit run until you're correct. And don't expect to hit run and be correct, like, ever. No one ever writes code and hits run and it's correct the first time. 
Maybe when we're writing simple programs at this stage, it could happen. But as, you know, like that doesn't happen. No one, no one does it like that. Almost like 99.99999% of programming is staring at code you already wrote and going, what the hell's wrong with it? That's what's normal. I'm not being pessimistic. Again, this is just setting your expectations not to be that hacker, which is entirely a, a meme. Uh, so it's that luxury of being able to hit run, knowing if you're right or wrong, with the fact that you can just keep trying until you're right, which is brilliant. We're very lucky like that. So you're going to be wrong. Yeah, most, the majority of programming is actually debugging. Get used to making mistakes. This is a good thing. This is normal. All right, so this one. Now, there are a lot of challenges that new students that are learning to program uh, face. So there's a lot of resources made available to you. And the number one one is Google. There's the YouTube videos, email, there's Google, office hours, there's also Google Labs, and don't forget Google. It's a joke in programming. Like, you can go, if you type in, like, just Google it, you'll find a billion memes about how, like, oh, I got a degree in computer science, which means I know how to Google. <laughs> like, that's the joke. Because if you are having a problem writing your code, and you like ask me, like, oh, how do I do, can you explain this to me? I will not be able to explain it better than the top result of the one billion results for that specific problem that you've run into. Like, it's not gonna happen. If you're running into an issue, someone's been there before you. See what they did. So get used to like, hmm, how do I solve this? Well, how did they do, you know, like, use the resources available to you, including Google. Do that. It's, it's like a, it's an achievement to get an email from me. If you send me an email like, oh, with this question, and I respond to you saying, did you try Googling it? You should, that's a, good for you. <laughs> You've achieved something. Why am I making, why am I bringing up Google? Well, when a programmer isn't debugging, they're Googling it. That's not a joke. That's exactly what they do. Google it is a very common phrase, not just in this course, it's just in this world. It's a great skill to learn. Because you could just, I know I could say like, oh, Google it, but there's also like an art in how to Google a question, right? You have to know how to like ask the question a certain way. So that's a skill that you need to develop, especially in the context of programming. Uh, it's basically all programmers are doing that, so it'll be your go-to in the future. And really, one of the number one things, so like if you look at pedagogy for adults, like, there's like a list of things that we, like, like as a prof, there's a list of things that I want to like encourage, right? And in this list, like you want to encourage peer learning and peer teaching, that's really effective. You want to encourage like, you, you want to like communicate high expectations, that's something that showed to be really effective for increasing like student outcomes. But at the top of that list, the number one thing you can do is to encourage independent learning. Google it, just figure it out. Because that's what programming is, is just figure it out. Keep beating your head against that keyboard until you get it right. All right, well, can I write a program now? Sure. Who here went through the getting set for 161 page on the website? Half a person, all right, cool. Cool, don't worry, you didn't have to. Here's what we're gonna use. So in the past, what I used to do is, I mean, depending on how far back you want to go, I've done different things. But in the past, like, if you're writing code, you need to, like, you can write code in any text editor you want. Like, you can open up Notepad and start writing code. But unless you have, like, the program on your computer to run that code, it won't work. So in the past, what you've done is you went and then you downloaded Python, so you can start writing Python programs, but no one really writes code in like Notepad. They use something called an IDE, an Integrated Development Environment, which is this really fancy tool where we, where we write our code. It's really nice. So you have to download another thing, and you have to make sure these things are connected really well. And every year, it's a bit of a nightmare. And how many of you have a Mac in here? There was always issue with the Mac people, so I don't know. It was really a nightmare. But now, there's something called Google Colab, which is 
amazing. If you just go into Google, raise your hand if you don't have a Google account. I know, it's kind of hard not to, right? Perfect, you're all set. Go to, go to Google and type in, literally, like watch. So let's pretend I'm not here already. Colab, right? Oh, first hit, perfect. You might have to sign in. It's being slow, the internet issues today, we all know. This right here, Colab, it's got a style of programming called like notepad style programming, where everything's kind of like in its own cell, and you could add like words, like you can write, it's, it's really nice, but if this will load, I shouldn't have exited it. Oh. Open Colab. This is where we're, gonna, where we're gonna write our code. What's cool about this is, actually, all the code we're hitting run on doesn't run on your computer. It runs on Google's computer somewhere else. So it's actually pretty neat. Um, we'll let it load. This is where we're gonna do all of our programming in Google Colab. So you don't need to download anything. It's so much easier, you just go to this website. It works usually, I swear. And that's it. Usually, now there are a couple of things we'll see as we go. But what we'll do now, assuming we can get Colab working, is we're gonna write our very first program. And traditionally, the very first program any programmer writes is called Hello World. This has been the case for decades. All we're gonna do is write a program that outputs information, output meaning the computer displays something, input would be you give information to the computer. We're gonna output information and the information is just gonna be a words, the words that say hello world. That's all we're gonna do. Oh my, come on. Yeah, try again. If you were able to access Colab, feel free to do what I told you to do. In this code, we are calling a function that takes some argument. The argument is the thing I want to print out. And then when I hit run, the program executes that code by running the function to print something out to the screen. There we go, print. If you are able to, try, try along, and then we're gonna run this block. The first time you hit run, it might make a, take a moment because it's gotta like connect to the server and everything. Connecting dot dot dot, yeah. And that's, that's that. If you get this working, which this should work, if you get this working and you hit run and it works, despite how simple this program is, it's a program. You can go home and tell your mom and dad that you're a programmer now with this little line of code. It's a bona fide program. There, there we go, cool. See, it says hello world. There is a lot to unpack here, but if you got this, you open it up, you type that in, you hit run. Mind you, you do not type the number one in front. That's just showing the line numbers. By the way, like if I just, it's just line numbers. Yours might not have it. There's a setting on Colab to turn on if you need it to. Print hello world. Raise your hand if you got it working. Perfect, you're a programmer. That's it. Now, this is the first year we've had to do it because Google has incorporated their AI into Colab and it ain't pretty. So, Google has incorporated Gemini, kind of like ChatGPT, and it's gonna, tr like if you leave this setting on, it's gonna try to like help you write the code. So if we go here in the getting set, I give you instructions on how to turn this off. Warning, we wanna turn this feature off for a few reasons. One is the type, like the level of code that Colab's Gemini is okay with writing is like the level of code that we're learning. So if it's, writing the code for you, you're never gonna learn how to do it. So that's obviously a problem, but maybe even more importantly for you, even though I think the first point's a pretty big one, maybe more importantly for you is, it's wrong. 
Now, if you're an experienced programmer, you could catch the mistakes and fix it. But when you're a new programmer, and you think it's helping you, and you're expecting it to be right, and it's not right, and you're wondering what the hell's going on, yeah, we got a big problem. So we definitely do not want this feature to be on. And to follow these steps to turn it off. I've already have it turned off on mine. Tools, settings, AI assistance, and like I just flipped the, the check boxes. But we definitely want to turn that off. And then we're good to go. Any questions before we wrap up for today? Remember, labs, assuming you have a Thursday lab, they start tomorrow.